All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome again to our Date with History series and this special month where we're going to start our commemoration of the 80th anniversary of Operation Torch. As usual, my name is Laura, the Public Programs Coordinator over at First Division Museum, and we don't want to waste any time, so we're going to get right into it. So, of course, I always want to remind everybody what is our next upcoming Date with History, and this is going to be the last Date with History for this year. So I hope everybody is able to join us here at Cantini Park in person or virtually via Zoom, and that is going to be on Thursday, December 1st, and the presentation is called Chicago's Arsenal of Democracy. We're going to be learning a little bit more about the over 1,400 Chicago companies that converted almost overnight from peacetime to war production during World War II. And what's really exciting about this presentation is that our presenter is going to share with us some rare images of some of the locales that were uh, utilized in one of the largest war factories that was ever built. And that's going to be presented to us by his historian Jerry O'Connor, the author of the book The Hidden Places of World War II. So we hope you come out and join us for that one. It sounds really interesting. But let's go ahead and get us started tonight with our speaker, and of course, is a very special speaker. Our speaker this evening is Jessica Wozak. She is the museum specialist at the First Division Museum at Cantini Park, right here in Wheaton, Illinois. Jessica earned her graduate degree in history from Roosevelt University. After transitioning into the museum field from practicing emergency paramedicine full time, Jessica started as the volunteer and has since been promoted to her current position. She is tasked with supporting the collections department and helping develop and implement exhibits including Nuremberg, Nazi Germany on trial, and the Mexican American military experience. Outside of the museum, Jessica has participated in panels for the Smithsonian Institutions uh, Towards a More Inclusive Women in Military History Conference in 2018 and the Society for Military History's Annual Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in welcoming museum specialist Jessica Wozak. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you, Laura, for inviting me tonight. Thanks to those who um, came in person and everyone that is virtual with us. Uh, this year, we are celebrating the 80th anniversary of Operation Torch. It's the initial American ground troop offensive in North Africa. There were approximately 100,000 troops, mostly Americans, uh, that landed in North Africa. And included in these numbers were nurses, women of the Army Nurse Corps. Specifically tonight, I'm going to talk about the nurses and staff of the 48th 128th Evacuation Hospital. Out of the original 60 nurses at the 48th 128th, 17 served in close contact with the front lines for almost three years continuously. So a couple of years ago, <clears throat> I was pursuing, you know, um, looking online at online resources uh, at the First Division Museum, and I came across this slide. I began to dig through the digitized records of the McCormick Research Center, and I thought it was odd that they specifically included six nurses. Although it is now commonplace for women to be in highly skilled and dangerous positions, 80 years ago, it was not. Clearly, it was outstanding enough that official paperwork specified nurses when talking about resources for landing. Well, a quick internet search can provide answers such as who the 48th Surgical Hospital was and what they became. I dove into primary and secondary texts along with our archives and began to see a story that really filled out and enhanced the narrative of the 1st Infantry Division and the US Army during World War II. I, as I found more, I, I knew I wanted to share uh, and emphasize the nurses' role and their efforts. Uh, and, and particularly, I decided I would share that by paralleling them to one of the most distinguished divisions in the US Army, the 1st Division. So among those headed to Africa, I was able to highlight Therese Archard, Genevieve Kruzik, and Margaret Hornbeck. These three were distinctly um, tied to the 1st Division. Teresa Archard was one of the more experienced women. She joined the Army Nurse Corps. Initially, she was with the American Red Cross. And then she joined the Army Nurse Corps in 1941. 
She spent about 18 months overseas, and she was sent back to the United States due to health reasons. Joining her was the middle picture there, Genevieve Kruzik and Margaret Hornbeck. Now, Genevieve was born in Cicero, Illinois, and grew up in Gary, Indiana, where she finished school and began her career as a nurse. She enlisted in 1942 and spent her military career with the 48th, 128th. Now, Margaret Hornbeck, that last picture there, she was from Shelbyville, Kentucky, and she and her best friend enlisted the day war was declared. There were also a couple others that I can mention by name, Ruth Haskell, Edna Atkins, and Marie Kelly. Ruth was 33. She was a career nurse before the Army Nurse Corps and one of the few women who had a child at home while she was overseas. She returned to the U.S. at the end of Operation Torch due to a back injury, but remained with the Army Nurse Corps and toured the United States speaking about her experience and the need for nurse volunteers. In 1944, she published a book, Helmets and Lipstick, an Army Nurse in World War II. Edna Atkins was also in her 30s, and so was Marie Kelly. They both came from civilian nursing jobs before the war, Edna from Green Bay and Marie from Wilmington, Delaware. In 1940, the female applicants to the US Army Nurse Corps had to be a citizen of the United States between the ages of 22 and 30, high school graduate, a graduate of a nursing school of approved standards, registered, and a member of the American Nurse Association. So for the women who ended up going to the Mediterranean and European theaters, they started with these credentials and their careers in US Army bases, very similar to civilian hospital counterparts. The nurses of the 48th had all volunteered for, for foreign service. So between August and mid-October in 1942, the women traveled from their base hospitals to New York and then on to England, where they underwent weeks of physical training, drill instruction, and road marches. A lot of ad hoc military training. They subjected them to calisthenic and, calisthenics excuse me, and miles of hiking. Unfortunately, the women were not well supplied with uniforms and had disabling blisters from wearing men's boots in the wrong size and fit. Despite these discomforts, they persevered and were able to eventually um, get uniforms and better fitting shoes. After a short trip from England to Inverary, Scotland and more drilling, the women loaded onto ships with the 1st Infantry Division and headed to North Africa. The men and women on these ships did not know until they came through the Straits of Gibraltar that they would be part of the assault team that landed on the North African coast. <clears throat> now remember, keeping it simple, uh, our, our basic history, prior to World War II, France controlled three North African colonies and the Vichy French government had signed an armistice with Germany. Now the Germans and Italian troops had begun an assault on British colonies in uh, Egypt and Libya in 1940. So they were reigning almost completely from east to west across the coast due to their success and lack of resistance in the French colonies. So this is 1940, and these things are happening. And by 1942, Franklin Roosevelt overruled his military advisors in trying to figure out where to begin their assault. And he gave troops a direct order to support the British proposal of an assault on French North Africa. So these, these women are moving along at this point after Roosevelt's um, uh, edict, and they are part of this center task force uh, where the first division would also be landing on two different beaches near Oran, Algeria. Beach Y was the 26th regimental combat team led by Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt Jr. And the Allen group led by General Terry Allen was comprised of the 16th and 18th regimental combat teams at Beach Z, the easternmost position on the map. With these, you can see elements of the 48th Surgical Hospital were also sent in at the same time at both locations. Uh, it's a little difficult to see, but ELM and 48th down at the bottom of those locations. To be specific, Ruth Haskell, Marie Kelly, and Edna Atkins were all with the Allen Group. These nurses loaded onto barges just like the enlisted men did and went ashore with sniper bullets hitting the, the sand all around them. <clears throat> 
By 5 p.m., the nurses of the Allen Group had gathered on the beach and headed another 150 yards to a headquarters hut. Although it is not certain who was with the 26th Regimental Combat Team, we do have this record of six nurses, eight officers, and 20 enlisted men arriving at Le Andalus with the assault team. Ruth Haskell, Marie Kelly, and Edna Atkins, and two surgeons from the 48th were detached to the 1st Medical Battalion, 1st Infantry Division, the very first night. They had been, the battalion aid station had been overrun with patients in our zoo and they needed support. So the three nurses triaged three floors of soldiers in a building and all remarked that they had never seen wounds such as in combat. For the next 36 hours, the 48th Surgical Hospital staff worked in surgery and triage with very few supplies. They had snipers trained on the medical buildings and rats running along the walls in plain sight. After two days of nonstop work, they had cared for 480 casualties. And this was their introduction to the next few years of life as members of the Army Nurse Corps. So the 48th Surgical Hospital was the first and only one of its kind in North Africa. The Army's medical department had recently reorganized and implemented this new chain of evacuation for the North African campaign. Casualties, so injured uh, soldiers, were initially tended to by frontline soldiers and medics before being taken to battalion aid stations. They were assessed and transferred further behind the front lines for care. Patients regularly moved to field hospitals or evacuation hospitals based on the severity of the injury and the number of casualties at hand. The 48th Surgical Hospital was a hybrid of these two hospitals. So they were small groups of highly trained surgeons and nurses, very close to the fighting front. They could render quick, life-saving surgical interventions. And most importantly, this unit could physically be picked up, packed up, and moved by its personnel to remain with the infantry during operations. So from the time they landed in North Africa until the Germans had fully vacated the region, the 48th leapfrogged with two parts of their hospital so that they were always available to the fighting forces at the front. Now in February 1943, the first and second units of the 48th were 30 miles behind uh, north and south pretty much of the 1st Infantry Division when the Germans overran Kasserine Pass. Margaret Hornbeck remembers, we weren't acquainted with the large number of casualties. It was in the night when they began to reach us. Admitting was full and there was no way to take care of what was there. He, the doctor, was doing decompression. They set up to do brain surgery in the midst of all that. It was a strange situation to be doing brain surgery out in the field. It was nothing short of amazing. The concept of the American fighting force and we along with them. By February 17th, the Germans came within five miles of that first unit hospital, and both the unit hospitals ended up retreating. Dr. Leonard Schwade wrote in his diary on February 19th, we are the only medical unit between the Germans ahead and Tabessa. Everyone else has pulled out. The move that they did back up to uh, put them with the 77th evacuation hospital, and there they were in charge of 900 patients from Kasserine. So throughout the Tunis campaign, the 48th Surgical Hospital received 90% of the casualties and was considered the closest hospital unit to front lines. <clears throat> After Kasserine, the 1st Division reorganized and brought all its elements back together for a final push. For those casualties, as during other battles, the medics and aidmen were the first to come to their rescue. According to Herbert Goldberg, historian of the Medical Detachment, 16th Infantry Regiment, it can truly be said that any man seriously wounded and capable of surviving the first hour after the infliction of the wound reached the larger medical evacuation installation in fairly good shape. All credit for the excellent record must be given to the battalion surgeons, the company aid men, particularly the litter bearers, and other members of the medical detachment who performed their duties completely and without regard for their safety and personal welfare. The nurses all agreed that they were able to do their job so well because of the initial care given by fellow medical professionals. 
Well, within a few weeks, the hospital units were moving forward and holding while American and British forces ended that last great German offensive in North Africa. Despite this forward momentum, or perhaps because of it, Ameri uh, the hospital units were still seeing massive numbers of casualties, and staff was working up to 24 hours in surgical wards. Lieutenant Archer recounted one incident in which the unit appointed three nurses for round-the-clock care of a single patient. This patient had been gravely wounded in the abdomen and required six hours of surgery to repair his colon. After days of blood transfusions, suctioning fluid out of his stomach, and turning him to keep fluid from building in his lungs, the young man went from grave to serious condition and appeared to be in recovery. On April, in April 1943, 20 miles from the front, Lieutenant Archer found out that the hospital was reorganizing to an evacuation unit. Although they were successful, it was redesignated the 128th Evacuation Hospital. The Army no longer used surgical hospitals in the Mediterranean and European theaters of operation through the rest of World War II. They would technically receive fewer patients who had already been stabilized by battalion aid stations and forward hospitals. Nurses were supposed to go from 12 or 18 hour shifts to five hour shifts. Ultimately, however, there were still long hours and large casualty numbers. The first week of May, the newly formed 128th Evacuation Hospital treated 910 casualties. But on May 12, 1943, the 128th Evacuation Hospital learned that the North African campaign was officially over. The men and women of the US Army and Army Nurse Corps had earned their first campaign ribbon. Without rest, the Allies began to prepare for the next invasion. Named Operation Husky, British and American troops were planning an attack in Sicily to continue putting pressure against the Axis forces in the Mediterranean. 90 miles off Sicily's coast in Tunisia, the men and women repacked gear, planning uh, for this second amphibious assault. Commanders who were planning the operation requested army nurses for the invasion but General Eisenhower denied the request. Although the women of the 128th Evacuation Hospital performed beyond expectations, Eisenhower preferred not to provoke the American public in a debate on whether women were too close to combat zones. So in the end, the nurses and their hospitals arrived days, even weeks, after the landing of combat troops. <clears throat> so at 2 a.m. on July 10, 1943, the initial assault teams from the 1st Infantry Division landed in Jaila, Sicily. They began working their way up the beaches. The 1st Infantry Division was immediately attacked upon their arrival. The German panzers made it within range of the division command post. Still, with the support of naval guns offshore, artillery, Sherman tanks, and anti-tank guns, the American forces forced the Germans to withdraw from Jaila. 21 days later, the 1st Division was fighting through mountain terrain for the town of Troina. Troina was the last strong point before the city of Messina, the escape route to the Italian mainland for German troops. For six days, the division fought with minimal gain and some failures. By the sixth day of battle, the Germans faced the reality that they could not hold out much longer and supplies had diminished to almost nothing. After an initial denial, the German commanders approved the withdrawal from Toyena. The 1st Division had survived 24 counterattacks in a week, and at the cost of 1,600 killed, Troina was in Allied hands. Combat medic aidman Alan Town was one, of the first, was one of the 1st Division men who waited ashore at Jela and worked his way to Troina as part of a medical aid battalion. Trap Town described how, during the weeks leading up to Troina, battle injuries were generally wounds from shell fragments and mines. These ranged from the slight to the traumatic. But by the time the battle for Troina was over, they saw more gunshot wounds and bayonet wounds. These wounds indicated the fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting that the division experienced in their toughest battle on Sicily. The 128th Evacuation Hospital arrived from Tunisia about three weeks after the invasion began, 
So about the time that the one idea was in Troina. Overall, there were never more than 5,000 hospital beds in Sicily, with a fighting troop strength of an average of about 166,000. So that means only about 3% of that troop strength would have gotten a bed in the hospital. Now, a total of 41,562 soldiers were hospitalized in medical facilities or in their quarters between July 10th and August 20th alone. That's about 25% of the troops at that point in time. All the hospital's staff worked overtime to admit battle casualties, non-battled injured, and diseased. The army evacuated many of the sick and injured back to North Africa as well. But everyone was feeling the stress of the front lines. And for medical personnel, enduring illness and exhaustion were not uncommon. Teresa Archer described herself as 25 pounds lighter dehydrated from dysentery, yellowed skin from adabrine, the anti-malaria tablets medicine that they took, and her hair had turned completely gray in her 30s. Now, Alan Town, he suffered from sand fly fever symptoms during the early part of the invasion. And yet with 104 degree fever, he continued his regular duties. A uh, significant setback for the Allies were virus transmissions from host insects in Sicily. They caused sandfly fever and malaria. During the entire campaign, the losses due to these illnesses alone equated to two divisions of soldiers and exceeded battle casualties by 20%. However, on August 17, 1943, the Allied invasion of Sicily ended. So other fighting units continued on to Italy, but the first division was transported to England. With two amphibious assault landings under their belt, the division was considered one of the most experienced units and was going to be a part of the next great assault. As for the 128th, they remained in Sicily a little longer, and exactly one year after their initial landing in North Africa, on November 8th, 1943, the whole 128th evacuation hospital set sail for England and their next phase of living. England was a respite for the men and women who had spent a year moving across North Africa and Sicily. The nurses of the 128th were now the most experienced women in the European theater of operation and spent much of their time traveling and training newer hospital units. The first division had already set up in Dorset, England, and Alan Town had been promoted to surgical technician. He spent much of his time training at an army base hospital. By May 1944, he had finished hospital training and was readying for departure. In his journal, he wrote, all the moves were made on the 29th. Rations, cigarettes, and other field items were issued on May 31st. We knew the invasion was on and very soon. The division was done resting and training and Operation Overlord was in motion. <clears throat> on June 6, 1944, more than 150,000 Allied soldiers disembarked on the coast of France. Across 50 miles of beaches, men advanced into heavy German defenses. Separated into five beach sectors, the American troops stormed two, Omaha and Utah. On Omaha Beach, the 1st Infantry Division arrived up to 600 yards from shore. Men swam through the water, dodging machine gun fire, and made their way up the beaches that were mined and covered in barbed wire. As casualties began mounting, the survivors pulled them from the shallow water onto the beach and had no choice but to pull them directly into machine gun fire. It wasn't until the evening of D-Day that the aid stations and collecting stations were organized enough and offering more than first aid. One platoon from the 1st Medical Battalion created a clearing station on the high ground above Omaha and treated casualties for the next 36 hours. By June 7th, surgical teams were able to get to some supplies and get to the seriously wounded. Now, the first two hospital units that set up near Omaha Beach were on June 8th. Those hospitals were organized and opened without their staff of nurses. West of Omaha on Utah Beach, Naval Beach Medical Section started the evacuation of casualties there 
and medical battalions began, arri began arriving on the morning of D-Day, but within 24 hours, they were overrun with casualties and had received patients from the D-Day movements, as well as nearly 300 patients coming from the interior, from the 82nd Airborne Medical Stations near St. Mary Glace where there were high numbers of casualties among paratroopers and gliders. By the evening of June 9th, the staff of the 128th set sail, and they sailed past a torpedoed oil tanker that had caught fire and sank in the English Channel. Truly a somber reminder that their ship might not reach the unloading station. To further amplify this, their convoy began running parallel to the coast when an American motor launch flagged them down. The ship was offshore of Omaha Beach, not Utah Beach, where they were supposed to be heading. And they were in waters very heavily mined by the Germans. So with a little help, they repositioned and got back on course. At 3.30 in the afternoon on June 10th, the 128th began climbing into barges for the trip to shore. Again, the first female nurses to be deployed in the European theater of operations. The women were offloaded yards from the beach and walked through the water before to get to dry land. The veterans of the first amphibious landing compared it to their current arrival, and in nurse Helen Maloney's words, at least Arzu didn't have dead bodies floating offshore. But at Normandy, the water was only waist high instead of reaching my shoulders as it did in Arzu. For the first few weeks in France, the 128th Evacuation Hospital was sort of sandwiched between the interior and the coast in Boutevilla, about five miles from the fighting. The casualties who needed surgical procedures but were stable or overflow from field hospitals could be moved immediately to the evacuation hospitals where doctors performed specific operations. Head, neck, face, and brain injuries were commonly handled at the 128th. Within about three hours of their opening, the hospital had 123 casualties, and by the week was over, they were over their capacity of 400 beds. Patients would arrive, and, and they would be prioritized and prepped for procedures. Often, tents were lined up so that the wounded could be moved linearly from triage to pre-op, surgery, and finally to a recovery ward. During the Battle of Normandy, evacuation hospitals such as the 128th were the primary conduit to the hospital, the patient's removal to England and the primary conduit to that frontline field hospital. Patients would remain in the ward until they were stable enough to be transferred to the larger stationary hospitals away from the fighting. Or they could stay at the evacuation hospital up to 14 days and then return to duty after their recovery. The surgical staff could perform 100 operations in 24 hours, but the influx of casualties often surpassed that, causing this backlog of surgeries. One source claims that in the first two weeks of the 128th landing, 2,840 out of 3,200 patients coming through their tents required surgery. Detachments from another surgical group and another evacuation hospital arrived by June 16th, and so they were able to reduce that backlog. <clears throat> so from the coast, uh, Allentown compares the American troops' movement to the German Blitzkrieg, writing, now we had the US Army Blitzkrieg. It was almost in the same location. Units were moving up to 30 miles a day at some point, and resistance could be minimal and disorganized at best. So the 1st Division's troops were arriving in Belgium by the beginning of September and were facing off at that Siegfried line. Trailing the 1st Division, the 128th Evacuation Hospital was just southwest of the Filet Argentan pocket in mid-August. So the division quickly moved past Paris, and the hospital actually remained taking in casualties from the Filet pocket. Dr. Leonard Schwaid wrote, Filet pocket now closed and remains of Jerry Division trapped, being slaughtered. Got over 400 vehicles and 250 tanks by Air Corps in one day. 
The 128th took in the German POWs and those who needed medical care. And by August 21st, they had to use 66 ambulances and five two and a half ton trucks to move the POWs to enclosures and hospitals farther away. As soon as they finished that, they caravaned another 360 miles to Belgium and set up in a building where they were gonna spend the next couple months. Moving along in time, September 17th, that was the first organized attack of German troops near Aachen. The attack was preceded by the most intense artillery fire of the campaign. The 128th Evacuation Hospital received its first three patients from the 1ID combat units that day. One of the three, PFC Carmen J. Napolitano, was discharged on disability due to artillery shell fragments and an ensuing bone graft surgery. More than 120 division soldiers were treated at the 128th Evacuation Hospital through September, the majority of whom eventually returned to duty. The 128th was able to watch from their location as the battle went on, and finally it ended on October 21st, 1944. Soldiers with grievous wounds continued to pass through the hospital, but regular life-threatening, regular life illnesses were also occurring, so non-life-threatening. Countless non-battle injuries, asthma, bronchitis, appendicitis, reoccurring bouts of malaria. Daily reports regularly recorded that the hospital staff, too, was getting sick. Uh, sick in quarters and sick in the hospital. Marie Kelly, one of those who had been with the original assault teams in North Africa, uh, got sick very quickly and she went into the hospital and five days later, she was relieved of her in assignment entirely. So living through the war included surviving common illnesses sometimes. After Aachen, on November 16th, 1944, the first division stepped off intending to take a section of the Hertgen Forest at the town of Heimich. The German troops' strong defenses in the forest began almost immediately, and they re repeatedly pinned the division down in the woods. The 18th Infantry Combat Team lost 18 men instantly, and more were wounded when a shell exploded in a tree above their head. Statistics reveal that for every yard gained, the Hurtgen claimed more lives than any other objective the Americans took in Europe. Quote, in the middle of November, any woods are likely to be cold, muddy, and miserable. The detested Hurtgen forest was particularly so, as written by the 1st Division's company historian of Company F, 2nd Battalion. The forest itself was a cultivated woods of more than 11 miles long and five to 10 miles wide. Rows of pine trees stood as tall as 100 feet above the forest floor. Paths through the forests were narrow and had been fortified with thousands of mines and log bunkers and barbed wires and kill zones since 1938. So German artillery and mortars would aim above the soldiers, timed with fuses would detonate, hitting the trees and sending shrapnel of metal and wood in all directions. Allentown recalled a high percentage of casualties being new replacements. He wrote that new guys were not inclined to drop to the mud as shells began to fly, especially if the man's clothes were still dry. The injuries sustained by the flying shrapnel were varied, but according to a British study during World War II, the front of the body accounted for 36% of the tissue in which shrapnel would be lethal. The same day that the 1st Division began its offensive in the Hurtgen, a notification went to the 128th Evacuation Hospital to be ready for significant numbers of casualties. By the end of the day, 71 of the 170 recorded casualties were 1st Division soldiers. And most of these men came in with shrapnel wounds due to artillery. <clears throat> According to the Surgeon General's office in October of 1943, open wounds and soft tissue wounds were examined and excised, so cleaned, of foreign body, bone particles, and impaired tissue was taken off and operated on when necessary. Most wounds were kept open and loosely dressed to be monitored and further uh, cared for if required. So these tasks and observations fell to the nurses on duty. As for the 1st Division soldiers brought in on November 20th, it appears that they survived beyond the care of the evacuation hospital and were transported to safer recovery wards or 
went back to duty. The Hurtgen Offensive ended at the beginning of December after the division attained its limited objective. Combat teams were being swapped out one at a time and the soldiers were being given a respite. This would be the first rest for the division since landing in France in June. The 128th was also relieved from the long days and large numbers of patients. The hospital moved nearer to Aachen and reopened with only 69 patients in attendance. Some lucky soldiers and nurses on the front lines were able to take leave up to 72 hours and go to cities in Belgium and even get to Paris. Margaret Cameron left her quarters to attend a dance and had no idea that the Germans had begun their massive offensive, nicknamed Battle of the Bulge. 15 minutes after she and her date got to the dance, he received word of the German breakthrough and they were both forced to return to work. Injured soldiers were being carried from the front lines, many with head wounds, as the German armor rolled through in brand the 128th tended new casualties, and rumors circulated that Germans were in their area. There was a strict blackout order at the hospital, and outside, the night sky was lit up with artillery fire. With only about half their beds filled, they prepared to pull back if necessary. <clears throat> 32 miles south of the hospital, units of the 1st Infantry Division spread along the northern shoulder of the bulge. The night Lieutenant Cameron returned to work, the 26th Infantry Regiment combat team went to Buchenbach, Belgium. It didn't take long for the chaos to become controlled defenses, and despite the momentum of the German troops, the Allies held fast. The 12th Panzer Division was determined to push past the 26th Infantry Regimental Combat Team uh, in Dom Buchenbach, but after days of trying and more than 13 tanks destroyed, or repulsed, the 26th drove them back and dug in to defend the area. On that same day that the artillery shattered the last of the 12th Panzer Division, the 128th Evacuation Hospital, like many hospitals in that area, uh, moved farther back from the battle lines. The patients were transported before the nurses, and it would take several days of traffic jams and slow travel before the nurses would be in their new town and able to open their hospital. On December 26th, the patients began streaming into this new location, and during the final week of December, the 128th Evacuation Hospital saw its largest census yet. The hospital treated 1,800 patients, and 595 of those underwent surgeries including Lloyd Quinn, Marion Escobar, and Alfred Yampaglia of C Company, 1st Medical Battalion. These three had been near the 26th Infantry Regimental Combat Team in Belgium, where the Germans were shelling them constantly. According to hospital records, Quinn, Escobar, and Yampaglia were all in the hospital with various injuries due to artillery blasts. Quinn had surgical skin grafts that resulted in discharge from the army, and the other two returned to dirt duty after their recovery. During this period, known as the Battle of the Bulge, the weather was frigid. Cold injuries plagued the army, and from the end of December through February, there were no fewer than 3,000 cases of frostbite each week. Allied soldiers were under-equipped with for cold weather conditions, they were undertrained for weather protection, and in many circumstances that forced them to consider life and death choices rather than cold protection. The losses due to cold-related injuries from November until the end of 1944 equaled the strength of one and a half divisions. The intense cold further affected severely injured soldiers arriving at the 128th hospital as well. Uh, they often resulted in amputation. As Allentown wrote, if a man got hit, even if the wound was not too serious, he could freeze to death, in, easily freeze to death, because no one would find him. Now he and his partner actually rescued two infantrymen who had been injured and covered in snow for 24 hours in one incident. After two bottles of plasma and a warm ambulance ride to the hospital, the color had returned to the men's skin, and town transferred their care to the nurses on duty. 
As January 1945 concluded, the Allies finally flattened the bulge, and the 128th Evacuation Hospital was averaging about 300 patients a day. They moved into a new town, and both the 1st Infantry Division and the 128th were settling in for that final push of the war. During this time, Colonel Norman Wiley of the 128th recommended Edna Atkins for the Bronze Star Medal. Approved and awarded in February, her medal citation read, by her constant devotion to duty and her exemplary conduct during enemy shelling and air raids, she contributed materially to her hospital's efficient functioning. She was among many from the unit who earned a Bronze Star, who earned a Bronze Star Medal throughout their time in North Africa and in Europe. By the end of World War II, approximately 1,600 awards and decorations were given to women. In the spring of 1945, the 128th Evacuation Hospital was in Germany to su support the Remagen Bridgehead. Just 23 miles away from the battlefront, they were back in tents. The fighting was trying to get across the Rhine River, and, and it was severe casualties uh, were arriving at the hospital. It was terrible. Um, Lieutenant Martha Cameron said, they were arriving in such a bloody mess that their own mother wouldn't have recognized them. See, the Rhine River was that last barrier, that last defense of the German uh, people, and, and they were certainly defending it. Allentown and the 18th Infantry Regiment crossed the Rhine River on a pontoon bridge March of 1945 and set up their aid station 16 miles across from the 128th. And then the 128th arrived across the river not long after. The 1st Division was swiftly moving behind an armored unit as the Allies advanced uh, across Germany. And April 4th, 1945, the operations that they were performing were complete. So with more than 300,000 Germans captured and over 100,000 casualties, the Allied victory in this area was, was definite. For the 128th Evacuation Hospital, the numbers of American casualties were low during April. But the work did not stop. The hospital was getting large numbers of prisoners of war, POWs, uh, German POWs, displaced persons, and allied personnel who had been held in German POW camps. These recovered allied soldiers uh, were suffering in various states of malnutrition, uh, but for the most part were better off in, than those liberated from other prison camps in the area. Ending their mutual European campaign 43 miles away from each other, the 128th Evacuation Hospital and the 1st Division shared a very muted joy when the Allies declared victory on VE Day, May 8, 1945. Allentown had an essential job, and the hospital staff was crucial. So their concern was that the Army was going to send them right to the Pacific Theater. See, although the Germans had surrendered, the Japanese fought on, and the potential need for manpower would fall to the divisions who were leaving the European theater. Now, the point system instituted by the military did support their uh, ability to go home rather than be sent to the Pacific Theater of Operations. It accounted for their time in service, so many of those from the 128th and from the 1st Division were high on the list to go home because they had been there for so long already. Allentown arrived back in the United States on June 15th, 1945 and the majority of the 128th Evacuation Hospital got home between July and December of 1945. Teresa Archard lived out her days in Falls River, Massachusetts and died at the age of 90 in 1997. Genevieve Kruzik married Murray Thompson, who also served and lived until 2004. Margaret Hornbeck was engaged to a soldier but during her deployment, the chaplain wrote to tell her he died of malaria while in southern France. After the war, she became the director of the nursing at her local hospital until she retired. For 912 days, the 128th Evacuation Hospital and the 1st Infantry Division forged their path through North Africa and Europe. Less well known than some histories, the women's story enriches 
the understanding of medical units traveling with fighting units. It relates that dedication and determination these women had and honors the nurses' service in the 128th Evacuation Hospital. Their lives sometimes were lost. Friends were made, honors and overseas stripes were earned. Through the Mediterranean and European theaters of war, the Army Nurse Corps nurses of the 128th Evacuation Hospital kept up that business of living at the speed and grit of their male counterparts. Now, I've also included a couple of resources here uh, that I found very helpful, um, and I can offer plenty more if anyone is interested. But I appreciate all of you uh, being here this evening and listening virtually uh, as I got to share the story of the 48th, 128th in World War II. Well, thank you so much. I'm, we're going to go ahead and get started with some Q&A, so just you stay right where you are. Um, just as a reminder for our friends who are in person, our friend Javier is all the way over there in the green. He has the microphone for our guests who are joining us in person. Should you have a question, you're going to let him know the old-fashioned way. You're going to raise your hand. Uh, please wait for the microphone so that everybody, including our friends on Zoom, can hear the question. For our friends joining us virtually on Zoom, should you have a question for uh, Ms. Wozniak, you can go ahead and use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. I know we often have a lot of questions, so we'll do our best to get to as many as possible, and I'm going to kick the evening off for you. So this guest would like to know a little bit more about battle fatigue. Um, so many of these nurses probably came into contact with soldiers with battle fatigue. How would that have been treated by the nurse corps? Great question. Um, battle fatigue was well known enough that it was being treated. Um, most often hospitals specialized in uh, those treatments. So these nurses in particular that I have spoken about tonight uh, didn't actively treat it, um, but they did see it. And they tried to do their best to pass the soldiers on if they could. Um, it, it depended sometimes on whether or not they could take them from duty um, and send them to uh, another facility for rest and recuperation. If they couldn't, there was a lot of um, homely care, right? So you know, the simple things, Margaret uh, Hornbeck talks about making pancakes in North Africa and serving them to the soldiers that were at the hospital. Um, so, so sometimes it was the, the simpler things that they could do. Um, but battle fatigue itself was a cared for and noted um, injury at that time. I do want to acknowledge that some of our Illinois state teachers are commenting that they would like to see these resources again, which is why I've pulled them up on your screen. And I'm sure that Ms. Wasak will be more than happy to send me some more over that I can share with you, um, should you like them. I have another guest who's wondering about if there were any male nurses in the nurse corps. There were. There, it, they were very few and far between. Um, the Army had a tendency to look at men in, in nursing positions in a different light than women. And this even went all the way through uh, the Vietnam era. Um, so it was not a job that uh, men, that, that was taken kindly to when a man was a nurse. However, enlisted men were um, medical technicians, um, they were able to be corpsmen, so, so they were supportive hospital staff, but most often they were not nurses. Great question. And again, to our guests who are in person, feel free to join the conversation. You just have to raise your hand. That's how Javier will know to get you. All right. Okay, I have another question coming in from here. This guest wants you to know, thank you so much. You did a great job. Um, they want to know, during the Battle of Aachen and the Hurricane Forest, mm -hmm. Where was the 128th located? Oh, I can take it back a couple slides. So teachers, I apologize. I'm gonna go back and you can actually see, I, um, oop, there we are. I created a contemporary Google map uh, so that you can see by walking, uh, Balin, Belgium, so down south, compared to Aachen, where the main battle took place, uh, would be about four hours away. So if you were walking that, that's where they would be. 
So in your research, you mentioned that one of the nurses that you researched did maintain a nursing career after the war. As you've been learning more about these women, did you notice that many of them continued their nursing careers? Virtually all of them did. In fact, the, the ones that I named specifically did continue their nursing careers. Um, they had families most often, and um, so they, they portrayed the roles of uh, women in the eras that they uh, remained in the hospital beyond. So in the 50s, 60s, 70s, all the way through, they, they did re retain their nursing status and um, have families and, and do regular uh, people things. Interestingly though, the majority of them did not talk about their service. So there are very few records post-war. Uh, Teresa Archard and um, Ruth Haskell, they wrote books that were published before 1947. Um, Edna Atkins is actually one of the women in 1947 who started the All Women's American Legion in Green Bay. Uh, so, and that continues to this day, that legion um, it still exists. Uh, however, they gave very few resources um, to us post-war. They just kind of went on with their business of living, regular life. We have a question in person. Javier is bringing the microphone over to you. I just have a quick question about the logistics for the field hospitals and the nurses. What vehicles were they typically supplied with by the Army uh, for transportation in order to keep up with the frontline units? Uh, two and a half ton trucks, so the deuce and a half. That was the most common um, thing. And then you, f you find um, ambulances or you, you kind of find rides. Uh, I have seen images of nurses riding in other vehicles, um, even Jeeps and stuff. But those, like a, a Jeep was um, very often used when they were doing um, uh, touring activities during downtime. Um, when they could get a ride to other places. So the hospitals were transported by two and a half ton trucks. Thank you. Thank you. This guest has some questions about um, medals, and they wanted to know if the women of the Army Nurse Corps received uh, different medals than male soldiers. Who? Um, I have not explicitly researched that. So I'm going to say that the medals were not different. They earned them in the same way. Um, however, in the, uh, the slide that I talked about Edna earning her medal, it was very explicitly written for the Bronze Star that she was materially supportive of her unit. So, you know, we're, we're talking in terms of semantics, but um, their medals were, and their commendations were, were very often written so that it is a supporting role for the um, Army Nurse Corps rather than necessarily an active role. You had mentioned earlier a little bit about the um, All Women's American Legion post in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Is there a museum dedicated to women's military history stories? Yes. In Washington, D.C., it is the women's I don't know if I'm going to get this right, the Women's uh, Military Memorial Museum. So it's right at Arlington um, National Cemetery. And they do have a museum and um, exhibits. In fact, we were lucky enough to have um, items of theirs on loan. So they have a really great selection of things. And I, here I am touting their, their wonderful stuff that they have, including a uh, virtual tour. So you can check out their whole museum. <coughs> What was their pay rate and pay scale? Oh, uh, their pay was not as much as men. So they, they entered as lieutenants. Um, and this was uh, given to them. This, this was a uh, title only. So it was not a lieutenant's rate um, that they earned. And it was a title simply so that they had the ability to command enlisted men when necessary. Um, so I, I 
cannot give you that number off the top of my head. I have a couple in mind, but I don't want to steer you wrong and tell you. So it was less than a regular lieutenant's pay rate. All right. Entitled to veterans benefits? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Not right away but they, they were in eventually entitled to veterans benefits. It did not happen um, immediately during the time of their service. Um, uh, who was it? Teresa Archard. She had a back surgery and she remained in the service of the Army Nurse Corps. Um, that was when she was doing her, her tour around the United States talking about the Army Nurse Corps. Um, and so, you know, things were covered as long as you were active, essentially. Um, and it wasn't until, hmm, was it 47, 48, where, where the women um, began uh, getting benefits. Do we know if any of these nurses continued on to service in Korea? Um, no, they did not. And I have one final question online, um, which is what was the average age of the women who served in the nurse corps? So believe it or not, um, this early section of women were in older, I'll say. So they were in their 30s, 33, 35. Um, this was because of the way nursing recruiting uh, happened initially. Uh, they were taking women who were already nurses, right? So they've already gone through college, they've, they've done their boards, and they are certified. And so they are um, most of the time older than um, the eventual uh, nurses who signed up and earned their, their nursing um, certificates or, or degrees within the Army. So, um did this evolve into like the mash units of Korea that you know we're so familiar with? Um, just curious. Yeah, great question. Um, the surgical hospital was the predecessor to the mash unit. Absolutely. Um, it again, it was successful for what they were doing, but it was more or less unnecessary um, because they were seeing that. We had a really good system from front lines to hospitals that we didn't, we didn't need to use up resources by doubling up on things. Um, so the surgical units, or the surgical hospital was kind of shelved until that, um, that time period in Korea when they became uh, called mashed units, correct? Yeah. All right, I just want to acknowledge that another, some of our teachers are asking about um, more titles of books, and uh, Jessica will be happy to share those with you, so we'll be sending those out. Or if you're just interested, drop me your e name in the Q&A, um, and I'll make sure I have everybody's email address via Zoom, and I can get those out to you. The same extends to my in-person guest. Leave me your email, and we'll share those resources out with you, should you be interested. All right, I think we're gonna wrap up the Q&A for tonight, then. So I want to uh, give everybody one more big round of applause for Miss Jessica Wazak. Thank you so much. Thank you. So again, just a, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you so much for choosing again to come out to Cantini Park. And a special thank you to all of our guests who braved the elements and joined us in person tonight, despite the really sloshy weather out there. Um, and I want to remind everybody to please come again and join us on Thursday, December 1st to learn more about Chicago's arsenal of democracy. And last but certainly not least, you can always wave to my friend in the back from the American Legion Post, Cantini Post 556. He is here in person this evening um, getting donations for the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Veterans. Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and we'll see you in December.